Hi, welcome to my channel. I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram. Uh, I hope you have subscribed to the channel and if not, please do subscribe and uh, try to share this information with your colleagues as well. Uh, if you have not liked the video as well, please like it because that's how the YouTube algorithm will recognize and spread the message. Today I will discuss a very important topic which is uh, a quick uh, approach to babies with respiratory distress. So when we see a baby with respiratory distress, we have some questions arising. So the first question obviously is the definition of respiratory distress and uh, you, I would refer you to my videos on definition of respiratory distress as well as the scoring of respiratory distress which gives an objective uh, way to assess the severity. So uh, once we decide that the baby has respiratory distress, we look at whether the baby needs additional support. So uh, it is in this decision making that it helps to have an objective scoring. So we have down score. Uh, we have Silverman score. I will share the link to the video which discusses the scoring of respiratory distress. And obviously the definition of respiratory distress is the presence of uh, visible distress in the form of increased respiratory rate or tachypnea, uh, increased work of breathing with subcostal intercostal retractions and grunting may or may not be there. Plus the monitoring may show difficulty in oxygenation and so on as well. So once we have uh, made that decision that the baby has respiratory distress, then you uh, look at what support the baby needs once you have a decision that the baby needs support. So the main objective of uh, treating the respiratory distress is to uh, correct the ventilation requirements, which can be through oxygenation and carbon dioxide exchange. And during the acute phase, the lung tends to be stiff. So we are more likely to need pressure Oxygen alone is not going to cure the problematic uh, pathophysiology because you need to open up the closed lungs. You may improve the saturation with oxygen, but that's not going to be relieving the condition and actually you may end up in a vicious cycle which worsens. So uh, most babies who manifest with respiratory distress with tachypnea recessions grunting, they need pressure rather than oxygen. So keep this in mind that if you do have a baby with significant respiratory distress, giving oxygen alone through a nasal cannula doesn't help. You need some form of pressure. It can be non-invasive or invasive. So uh, the next question that we discuss is whether the baby is suitable for non-invasive ventilation or we need intubation. So there are some features which suggest that the baby will manage with non-invasive ventilation. For example, the respiratory effort should be good and uh, the baby's uh, oxygen carbon dioxide levels will guide you as well. Most of the babies with acute respiratory distress in newborn with reasonably good gases and with good respiratory effort can be started on non-invasive ventilation and subsequent ex escalation of care will depend on the response. We also have to look at whether the lung disease is evolving or stable. For example, after the second or third day of respiratory distress, it's very unlikely that the baby will worsen. Of course, there can be uh, issues happening like infection, aspiration and so on where the baby may show worsening but in general terms uh, RDS for example is unlikely to worsen, TTN may not worsen after the first two days and so on. So if the lung disease is evolving that is in the first day or two of the disease the pressure requirements may increase, your uh, blood gases need to be monitored more often and you may need to escalate the support or give consider surfactant therapy for example. So if you are in the evolving phase you need something where you can adjust the pressures to a higher level, uh, titrate up or titrate down as appropriate. And uh, the question of whether we need surfactant therapy happens more in a premature baby or babies where there is a risk of RDS like in front of diabetic mother. And if you do consider RDS, uh, early surfactant therapy is uh, more useful. I'll also share the link to the video I made as a pragmatic approach to respiratory distress syndrome which will guide you on this subject as well. So irrespective of whether we use non-invasive or invasive mode of ventilation, the aim is to stay in the safe window. So this is uh, volume on the y-axis and pressure on the x-axis. And as you can see, as the lung gets stiffer, the curve becomes uh, flatter and uh, you need more increase in pressure to achieve a certain volume. So the lung complaints is low, which means uh, you need more pressure to make a unit change in volume. Initially, the pressure is taken up to open up the lungs and this is the zone of uh, derecruitment and atelectasis. Uh, once you reach a certain opening pressure, you will open up the lungs and 
once the pressure is increased beyond a certain level you reach the zone of over distension so that is baking so an increase in pressure will not change the volume so you are actually wasting the pressure and causing barotrauma so your idea is to come back down till you are in the safe window again and also you can drop further on the safe window without dropping the volume so the pressure can go down this is the principle of hysteresis so that's the idea of uh, ventilatory support so uh, as we discussed the baby with respiratory distress needs pressure you may need oxygen in addition to the pressure and you have to titrate the fao2 based on the saturation and if the baby is considered suitable for non invasive ventilation we start with nasal cpap of 5 to 7 cm if there is rds you wouldn't want to go beyond 7 cm without replacing surfactant because the lung is stiff and uh, trying to use more pressure may cause more uh, trauma to the lungs and you may increase the risk of air leak so that's the reason we consider early surfactant treat, uh, replacement so that's the same reason that you don't want to go into nippv unless you are confident that you need surfactant and you are replacing it and once you uh, need surfactant you can use uh, less invasive measures and uh, this is the point i made that you avoid excessive pressures before surfactant replacement and in the acute phase of rds as the disease is evolving and there is a risk of worsening you can prefer cpap or nippv rather than high flow Uh, once the lung disease stabilizes we can switch to high flow nasal cannula the reason i'm saying that high flow uh, is inferior to cpap in this instance is because there is a limit to which you can increase the pressure on high flow and you cannot know uh, the pressure that you are delivering as well so for example a high flow of 6 to 8 liters may deliver a cpap pressure of 4 to 5 while a baby with acute rds may need 6 to 7 or even uh, may benefit from nippv so Uh, we have to be uh, careful with uh, what mode we choose and if there is an acute rds with evolving picture it's better and studies have shown that to be uh, beneficial as well and in babies more than 28 weeks we can extubate the baby to either high flow or cpap or nippv as per the clinician assessment however in the babies less than 28 weeks there is a higher risk of extubation failure so we prefer to extubate to nippv Uh, if nappv is not available you use cpap so we have grades so nappv is better than cpap and cpap is better than high flow in the extreme premature babies and in the acute phase of disease once the baby is stable on a cpap pressure of say 5 cm water and fao2 less than 0.3 we can try high flow uh, and then uh, wean gradually or in a bigger baby we can wean directly from the cpap so in addition to discussing this it's also important to discuss a few steps that we can do to reduce intermittent hypoxemic episodes so in extreme premature baby who is growing up we often see significant drops in saturation it may or may not be due to apnea caffeine is there in the background but more often it's because of a slight loss in the lung volume either because of the baby's reduced respiratory effort or because there is reflux as the feed starts progressing so it's preferable to maintain a level of non invasive ventilation it can be a low level of pressure like 3 uh, liters of high flow or so in most cases and uh, we keep this till the baby reaches close to 32 weeks post menstrual age and the weight approaches 1.25 kilos or so this is because the chest wall complaints improves and the reflux episode may not cause that significant lung clo- volume closure and uh, when the lung closes what happens is uh, there is a relative hypoxia from the loss of the functional residual capacity and this may provoke apneic episode as well so by preventing these we are reducing the intermittent hypoxemic episodes most units follow this approach in the extreme premature baby still they are a certain size we continue non invasive ventilation even though it is at a low setting so it's also preferable to keep these small babies on two hourly feeds so that we can reduce the risk of reflux uh, so till the weight reaches 1.3 to 1.5 kg then we can move to three hourly of course if a baby goes on three hourly and you see more intermittent hypoxemic episodes you can go back to two hourly for a few more days of course this is subjective depending on the unit practice as well and uh, in these babies always uh, educate the nursing team on how to increase the flow or pressure on non invasive ventilation for a brief time after the episodes of recurrent desaturation so this helps to recruit the lung volume before the lung closes down before the hypoxemia causes further problems so it's uh, important to teach the nursing staff to do that uh, uh, so that the help is taken in a quick way i hope uh, this quick video helps and uh, Uh, just remember that if the baby needs uh, respiratory support for uh, lung disease where there is low complaints you need pressure rather than oxygen 
low flow nasal cannula oxygen will deliver only oxygen so high flow uh, more than 3 liters and CPAP and NAPPV are the ones that deliver pressure with non-invasive ventilation. There are only a small number of babies who need invasive ventilation. So learn to recognize the severity of distress and what support you need. And remember this, that low flow uh, doesn't help. Also, the humidification factor is important in very small babies because the wall outlet comes with very uh, high, I mean, uh, high pressure. You need uh, uh, pressure drop through the blender or uh, wall mounted uh, oxygen flow in addition the humidification is important because the gas comes very cold and uh, when it goes through a baby feels distressed and you may be uh, increasing the risk of crusting of secretions and so on so always humidify uh, that's why high flow uh, with humidification or CPAP is a good option in these babies thank you